but we have a very limited capacity brain. Um, in particular, the parts of the brain that underlie working memory and attention are famously limited capacity. We can barely remember a phone number. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is well studied in psychology. So the question becomes whether the parts of the brain that underlie working memory and attention can be augmented. Susan, we know that transhumanism is the hot topic today, especially with the growth of uh, AI into the public conscious. It's always been there, but with large language models, it now uh, imp impacts everyone. So uh, how, what's your overall thinking about transhumanism? Uh, you've asked the question, would you survive a merger with AI in being this uh, glorious transhuman uh, future? Yeah. So I don't think a full-on merger with AI is in the cards for humanity, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I am a bit of a transhumanist. So um, when I was young, I was reading the work of Ray Kurzweil and I was a techno optimist. I thought that um, technology would free us. And furthermore, as a transhumanist, I thought that we'd be able to upload the brain to survive the death of the body and that we'd be able to slowly replace parts of the brain with microchips. Uh, and that's where it gets into this idea of, you know, whether we could merge with AI. So people like Elon Musk have claimed that eventually we can merge with artificial intelligence through using microchips like the ones that he develops at Neuralink. And he says we can do this to keep up with super intelligent AI as well as um, avoid being outmoded by AI in the workplace. OK, now we may be able to augment the brain to a certain degree, but I don't think we'll be able to fully be the same mm. as the level of intelligence that an artificial intelligence system can create. So it's unclear that we could merge with AI because, um, for example, in order to merge with artificial intelligence, you would need to be able to take in masses and masses of sensory material and you'd be able to you'd need to be able to sift through um, mounds of information. I mean, look what GPT does. I mean, it has at its disposal all of Wikipedia, all of the Gutenberg project and so on. But we have a very limited capacity brain, um, in particular, the parts of the brain that underlie working memory and attention are famously limited capacity. We can barely remember a phone number. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is well studied in psychology. So the question becomes whether the parts of the brain that underlie working memory and attention can be augmented. OK, and the problem with that <laughs> is that we don't know whether microchips can underlie conscious experience. So I'm somewhat skeptical of these claims, at least until we know whether um, microchips can underlie conscious experience. But even if they don't, I mean, they could, could they be a source of memory? Instead of having it on my iPhone, I would have the chip in my brain, so I would have immediate access to all the phone numbers, for example. Yeah, um, I think some <laughs> level of augmentation uh, will happen and can happen, and I just hope it's done safely and that um, we... <laughs> really solve a lot of the challenges with digital privacy and surveillance. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, it will be a thought data issue that we face in the future. I just don't know, though, if that constitutes a full on merger, the way the transhumanists claim. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's one thing to be sort of wired into our AI devices. It's another thing to be on intelligence par, if you will, with AI systems to merge with them such that we reach the same level of intelligence that they do. And I think that's what those transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil, Elon Musk, Nick Bostrom were promising. So that's the techno op optimist dream that a merger is at that level. And I'm saying we probably can get to here, but I don't see how the human brain could get to there, right? And even if you could, 
and this was, you know, a big point of my book, why think that that highly augmented individual would be you, right? I mean, you may just be creating a sort of computational descendant of you, right? That isn't really you surviving. You might have intended to augment your brain, but you might have accidentally mm -hmm. killed yourself in the process. Yeah, and th and that um, has been uh, studied through the thought experiment of the gradual fading or replacement. If you replace one neuron out of 86 billion in the cerebral cortex with a m microchip doing exactly the same thing, will you feel any different? Well, one out of 86 billion is not going to make uh, much of a difference. So no, and you know, the arguments of sort of a black and white fallacy, you keep going until they're all replaced. Um, and the question is, what happens to your consciousness? Is it, does it gradually wink out? Do you have no difference whatsoever? Do you have a new kind of consciousness? Where is the you? Um, I mean, th that thought experiment, which many people have done, Dave Chalmers, John Searle, I think others before, beforehand, um, is, is really a profound one. I think it's so profound, and I discuss it in my book. It's one of the first things I talk about in the context of machine consciousness. And these are called replacement arguments. Alvin Plantinga uh, also brought these up in his wonderful work. So I think a replacement argument like that is conceptually coherent. The problem is it's not clear, even if this was possible in terms of technology, that that individual at the end of the day would still be you, even if it was a conscious being. So mm -hmm. I think the replacement mm -hmm. arguments suggest that at the end of the day, there'll be some conscious being there, right? That has, it's sort of like a perfect simulation of your brain, um, or at least the parts of the brain that underlie thinking and consciousness and personality. But it does not follow from that, mm -hmm. that it's the same conscious individual and the big question is, at what point do you lose consciousness, right? And here, I'm just being skeptical, right? Because I always say to my students, metaphysics is a matter of life and death. Would you bank, bet your life on it, right? At what point would it stop being you? Or maybe it won't, and I'm wrong, but we just don't know. So we better approach the issue with metaphysical humility. But then on top of that, um, I'm skeptical that we could create perfect mimics in the realm of physics of the biological brain that aren't in a biological substrate, right? So, so there, there are really multiple issues that are uh, confounding each other like nested uh, Russian dolls that oh, yeah. to be sort of teased, teased apart here. One is uh, can non-biological materials become conscious under any condition, uh, non-biological? Another is can uh, can synthetic biology uh, of of one kind or another be conscious, um, and another is the interaction between our current consciousness, the current brain, and whatever is being used to enhance it. And is there a step function change? Is it gradual? Is it you know a kind of a winking out, as we've said? Um, so. I think to properly understand this, at least at this point, what we need to do is carefully distinguish the kinds of questions we're asking rather than mish, mish them all together. That's exactly right. Philosophers like to separate out what's logically or conceptually possible from what's compatible with the laws of nature, right? And also what's technologically possible. So there we have to separate three things out. And I think that thought experiment, this neural replacement case, or what Plantiga and Von Einwagen called a replacement argument, that talks about conceptual possibility. So even if you find it compelling, the thought experiment, it still doesn't follow that it's possible for us to survive a merger with AI and upload the brain by say, replacing all parts with computer parts. So, so I doubt that's the route to immortality. I would definitely look for biological enhancements. That's what I would do. I am a transhumanist in a sense. It's just that I'm a sort of, I guess, 
a weak transhumanist, if you will, <laughs> not not a, a full fledged strong transhumanist. Well, weak was never a word that I would think about in characterizing you, but I'll. Yeah, maybe the expression not good. <laughs> maybe I'll use the word realistic to make it sound like the one view. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a, a skewed word, so that's not fair either. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll make something up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.